Welcome to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast, where our mission is to ask the important questions to help us all make the informed pregnancy and parenting choices that we need to make. I'm your host, Dr. Elliot Berlin. I'm a prenatal chiropractor here in Los Angeles, California, and I'm here with our co-host, Casey Bixby, who is a costume designer and stylist and owner of the online retail boutique Bixby Atelier. And Casey's super pregnant with baby number... One. One. How you doing? Hello. Good. How are you? Fabulous. You know what we're talking about today? I do. The taboos. Pregnancy taboos. The no-nos. Or the yeses. Well, maybe it's yeses. The no's you thought were yeses. Fact versus myth is what we're looking for today. And in my office every day, so many people ask me these questions. Can I eat this? Can I drink this? Can I fly in an airplane? Can I, Right. I don't know, get into lift weights? Have you been holding back? That was on obviously the Me? first thing I asked you. Yeah, right if away. I you walked in and you're like, can I, can I keep running 20 <laughs> miles a day and lifting weights? And I said, sure. Uh, what What are you holding? Have you held back? Have you? Yes. I on... think it's the hardest part or the uh, or this, the part I don't like about pregnancy is because I've never been, I've luckily I've never thought about, I don't have any weird food allergies or weird eating habits. So I've never really had to think about what I ate and, um, and yeah, it's like you're on high alert for nine months, I feel like. Today we're bringing in uh, an expert, Dr. Jay Goldberg, who is a local obstetrician. Yes. And kind of laid back compared to a lot of other obstetricians. So yes. it'll be interesting to hear what he says as we throw all these different... I'm sure he hears these questions every day. And we also have a couple of other guests. We have your buddy. Yes. Anna. Yeah. We'll introduce in a second. And we also have a doula and mother of two, Maria. So let's bring them in. Excellent. Okay, so we have your friend Anna here today. Anna is uh, 40 weeks and a few days pregnant, having sporadic contractions. <laughs> so this could be an interesting podcast. Mm-hmm. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Happy to be here. Uncomfortable, but happy. So you're. Uh, this is your first pregnancy. Yes, it well. is. And um, how did you find it, the restrictions during pregnancy? Well, like the first three months, I think I was really neurotic about everything and the whole like, know this, know that. And then I spoke to my mom who was pregnant in Russia and they didn't have any restrictions. I mean, she like drank vodka throughout her whole pregnancy. (laughs) And my sister who lives in London, who also was eating like sushi and having wine. So I kind of loosened up a little bit. And also my doctor is a little more laid back than others, I think. Yeah. That's helpful. Uh, are there things that you still don't, that you're holding off on? I guess it's like the whole like pasteurized cheese thing, even though I've had not pasteurized cheese before, but I don't know why that scares me. So you're not holding that too much? No, not too much. But when your baby comes, I told Casey when I visit her, I'm going to bring her the deli sandwich and deli the meats. She's the same That's what, yeah. Oh, you missed. Oh, I have. Okay. I've been. Yeah, I've been holding on to deli meats, <laughs> which is really annoying. I've been having sushi. Yes. Okay, so deli and meat for you, sushi and... for Casey. <laughs> Beautiful. And we also have Maria. Maria is a doula, and also mom of two. Had baby number two just how long ago? Three months ago. Three months ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, where'd, where'd you have that one? You were supposed to be there, but not even the <laughs> midwives were there because I had him on the floor on all fours in the bathroom. By accident. At our house by accident. We were supposed to go to a birthing center about 10 minutes away and could not make it to the car. Fabulous. Yeah, yeah very different than my, my first... My when did you become a doula? Was it in between Just pregnancies? Just after, or? right after, I mean, weeks after I had my uh, daughter, I did the training and it's, it was at the sanctuary where, you know, you can nurse a baby and when they're newborns, they sleep so often that you could do something like that. So I became a birth doula, did that for two years and then became a postpartum doula in December. What inspired you to become a doula? I wouldn't have been able to make it through my first labor, uh, without my without my doula i had my husband who was amazing and i have a very supportive family but in the room i just had my doula my husband and and the doctor and the nurses coming in and out and uh, i couldn't have done it without her she helped uh, rally our team and then immediately you said i have to do this yes yes absolutely during your pregnancies did you were there things that you didn't do that you held back on because you were pregnant in the first one, not until we had some weird information on an ultrasound that ended up being nothing, but there was some hemorrhaging that the baby had and they didn't know what it was and they uh, had some 
prognostication that looked, they gave us, told us it might be something really bad. So at that point I had been pretty loosey goosey before then. And then for the rest of the pregnancy, I did hold off, uh, on a few things. And then the second time, the only thing I held off on was sushi, but not because I was afraid of it, but just because in here in LA, there are so many, uh, ways to get around it. I went, would go to get, there's one place that would have s- salmon that's a little bit cooked, mm-hmm. you know, these other like kind of fake sushi things. So I just kind of humored myself with that. And also I'm married to a Frenchman. So not having cheese and wine makes zero sense. So it was out uh, of the question. It's out of the question. So. <laughs> right. so you did have cheese and wine yeah. and sushi like things. Yeah. Sushi esque. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Do your clients have a lot of these questions or do you absolutely are always worried? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the good news is we have uh, Dr. Jay Goldberg here today, a very, very popular Los Angeles obstetrician. He's been practicing medicine since 1996, and um, lots of our patients love to go to Dr. Goldberg for, I think, a whole host of reasons. Number one, no agenda in childbirth um, other than what everybody wants, which is a safe baby and a safe, healthy mother. And number two is because uh, you're quote unquote laid back, not so all about the fear during pregnancy. And I think people are really looking for that and appreciating that. So thank you for coming on the podcast today. Thank you. We are going to shoot some of the questions that you must hear every single day in your office at you. So if we broke it down by category. First thing is food. Like Everybody talks about the food that you can't have. We already talked about with Casey and Anna, the, um, the deli meat and hot dogs things like that. What's going on there? I mean, usually the speech that I give pregnant women when they first come in, the new OB visits, there's usually four food groups that we touch on. Uncooked meat, unpasteurized products, cheeses, um, fish, like big fish, and sushi. So kind of we've touched on those things a little bit, but, uh, you know, when something's being made, you don't know how it's being made. So yes, there's plenty of sushi in Los Angeles. And yes, the majority of sushi is going to be fine, but I don't know what product isn't. So in part of my speech, I'm usually saying avoid big fish like shark, mackerel, swordfish, tilefish. You can eat salmon, you can eat tuna just in small quantities. Avoid unpasteurized products. Avoid um, deli meats, hot dogs, things like that. But I I don't wink at patients and say it's okay to have things, but I do say be smart about the way you approach things. And if if you've been to a sushi place so many times and you know that they're cleaning the knives and cleaning the boards beforehand, then right. and you know the fish is fresh. What is it about these foods that is a concern for someone who's pregnant versus somebody who's not pregnant? Bacteria and parasites. Toxoplasma is on uncooked meat and and some of these food products that you've mentioned like nitrates and listeria is a bacteria that we're mainly concerned with with unpasteurized products. So there's been listeria outbreaks in deli meats, in jamba juice, which is sometimes unpasteurized, really? in unpasteurized milks and cheeses. Oh no. I'm not. I haven't been going to Jamba Juice. Okay. Wait, (laughs) but going to Jamba Juice. This was a while ago. Wasn't there a huge outbreak of listeria in cantaloupe? In cantaloupe, which is not something doctors say they don't say avoid cantaloupe during pregnancy. Right. They don't say avoid fruit. So that's why it's kind of like. So you can't live in fear. It's more common in deli meats. Deli meats, especially when they cut them at the butcher or at the grocery store, um, it's not. You know, when they package it at the factory and seal it, and you take home that sealed deli meat, I think that's going to be a little bit more safe than when they take it out and they put it on the counter and then they start slicing it up right there in front of you. That's going to be more likely to be exposed to listeria. And listeria, you can't smell it, you can't taste it. So if it's in there, you won't know. But the CDC says if you if you steam it, if you cook it up to 165 degrees and it's steaming hot deli meat, you're going to kill the listeria. I have a kind. question. What if I heat salami and then put it in the fridge and let it cool? Nope. Why? The listeria comes back? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> It's the same that thing that happened the first thing. time. There was no They heat it. It's not raw meat. They, they cook the meat. But then it can pick up listeria. 
It's it, from any place. That surface that you put it on the first place before you cooked it, you have to eat it steaming. I mean, part of my speech is if it's packaged, it's going to be fine. But if you go to a farmer's market or you go to some open vendor, right? you know what? Pregnancy is not that long. You can avoid the deli meat right. for that short period of time because what's the consequence of eating the deli meat and it having listeria in it? Right. That's not something you want to deal with. No. What about eggs like eggs benedict they say there's like raw egg in the in the sauce and caesar salad uh, the dressing well i read that only really affects the mom and can't hurt the baby like the mom will get really sick but doesn't affect the baby true i would say the mom getting sick does affect Affect the baby baby, which is you're right i mean it's probably true but if you're sitting on the can for days in a row and dehydrated your fluid coming out everywhere right dehydrated Imagine being more miserable. <laughs> well, well, at least you had those eggs bent. I mean, they were so good. It was yeah, worth it. Totally worth it. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say, we don't want to put the fear in everybody about all this stuff because the truth is I've seen listeria. I can count on one hand how many se- times I've seen listeria in almost 20 years. And so it's not likely to happen, but you don't want to be that case study. Right. You know? And again, when they're passing around hors d'oeuvres at the cocktail party and you don't know if the cheese is pasteurized or not, you can pass on an hors d'oeuvre. You don't need to have that hors d'oeuvre. Unless you're really hungry. If you're really hungry. <laughs> or you have a sick craving for that hors d'oeuvre. I get those cravings. I don't know if you guys do. Um, the eggs, salmonella is 1 in 20,000 one in twenty thousand eggs, according to the CDC, is tainted with salmonella. But a lot of it is on the shell. So then the amount of, that if you wash them, the amount Do of... Do you eat the shell? I don't. She likes the shell. <laughs> <laughs> the shell's kind of good. It's not just me. Oh, good. Oh, no. <laughs> and then there's also a company that called Safest Choice where you can buy pre-pasteurized eggs. Oh, but that takes the fun out of them. <laughs> what, of the Russian roulette of the uh, <laughs> 1 in 20,000 eggs. Um, but it's not just eggs benedict. It's cookie dough. has raw eggs in it. Yeah. And um, mousse, meringues, tiramisu, and hollandaise sauce, bernays sauce, mayonnaise, a lot of things that uh, people make at home. A lot of delicious things. Salad dressings that you want when you're yeah, pregnant. Yeah, salad dressings <laughs> have raw eggs in them. So if you're, you know, if you're going to be careful, you got to be careful. Up until third trimester, I hadn't had much, and I had just had a few sips, and then I had a full glass of wine right the night that I, I delivered our baby. But let it be known that alcohol slows labor down. Um, if but I didn't have you. it, I would have. <laughs> right. yeah. For you, um, I guess there's when the... I blinked, basically. Right. <laughs> so, but yeah, I can like just like you said, bathtubs. Okay, once we're talking about fish, I'll point out smoked fish like lox, nova, smoked trout, and white fish also have the same susceptibility to listeria that deli meats do. And you mentioned swordfish, tilefish, king mackerel, and shark, and there we're concerned about the mercury. Correct. So there's methylmercury in particular, which is um, it's a harmful metal. It's a metal that can be harmful to the baby. So we try to cut down how much methylmercury we take in. And the methylmercury, just there's naturally mercury in the environment, and there's mercury from industrial waste, and it becomes methylmercury in the water, and then the fish eat it. So if you eat little fish, they just have a little bit of mercury in them. If you eat big fish that last longer and eat all those little fish, then they have a lot of mercury. So we try to eat fish that are smaller and then have um, less mercury in them. So which ones are the uh, good ones? White fish, salmon, freshwater salmon's probably better. So they have small amounts, but it doesn't build up in your blood. What about fish oil? Do people ask about supplements? Because there's sure. the, it seems like a, a balance. There's a benefit to having the omega threes. There are omega three fatty acids that we don't make that are essential that we have to have in our diet, but they're hard to get. And a lot of people are deficient in those omega threes. And one of the best sources is fish oil. But then you have to worry about the mercury. mercury. Fish oil. So what do we do with that? Right. Well, I mean, there's a lot of literature recently that's suggesting that it's excellent for not only fetal brain development, but for also adults to take Mm -hmm. these fish oils. Um, And they're being manufactured now. They can extract them in ways that they're not coming from fish. Hmm. Non-fish fish fish oil? Oh, omega-3s. Omega-3s, yeah. They're not from fish. Gotcha. (laughs) Did I say fish oil's not from fish? No, that's what it sounded like. It sounded like we're headed there. 
<laughs> but people that don't eat meat but do eat fish. And so right. they're like, I usually eat two to three servings a day. Right. What do I do? And so I say, you know what, that's probably too much. Right. Because even if you're eating these healthier fish, they still have mercury in them. Right. And so you want to, you know, if you can cut yourself back to three or four servings of fish a week, mm-hmm. that's more reasonable. Right. And then I think um, I think omega threes that come from non fish sources is a great idea. And but and then the omega threes that do come from fish oil, there are some that have um, they can f- they can filter out the mercury, they can purify it. So then you can you some of them have testing, and they tell you how many parts particles per trillion. Of right, and most of the prenatal vitamins that people are taking now, even over the counter Trader Joe's Whole Foods vitamins have the DHA in them mm-hmm. now. Because it's so important. Um, what about coffee? Caffeine? Chocolate? Um, I usually say uh, try and decrease your caffeine, but don't eliminate your caffeine. So mm-hmm. I usually say to keep it safe, have about one caffeinated product a day. And they often reply, well, what if it's decaf? So, you know, you can have two decaffeinated products, <laughs> that was yeah. say. definitely me. Um, <laughs> and they still have caffeine. But you have to mention what's, what has caffeine because there's a lot of things that have caffeine. And a lot of people are, like, introducing stuff into their smoothies now that these little beans. And they don't realize that some of cacao? these beans that they dry, cacao, has caffeine in it. Huh. And coffee and chocolate and teas. Holy cacao. So. <laughs> Who knew? Well, also, um, I've heard that having regular coffee and just less of it, just in general, not even with pregnancy, is better than, depending on what brand you get, than getting decaffeinated coffee. Because if it's a the chemical process, then that's worse for you than the caffeine in the regular coffee. Except there are some brands out there, I know, I think Intelligentsia, there are some that, that do it with a water, with water. decaffeination. Yeah. So you kind of have to get geeky and, and ask them how their ca- decaf is, is decaffeinated in order to feel confident about decaf. So... I would just usually pick some, uh, one cup of caffeine instead of. I mean, it's also unleaded. caffeine in the morning is kind of like a comfort thing for yeah. people. So you can also make the coffee and hold it in your hands and smell it and have a sip or two and then be satisfied oh, with yeah, that. No. That is evil. <laughs> <laughs> Tease, yeah, no. Te- teasing? <laughs> At least you said the sip or two. I thought you weren't even going to go that just far. Smell it. Just <laughs> smell it. <laughs> no. And give it your significant or nurse other it throughout with the day smile. And constantly reheat it. <laughs> I didn't have coffee my first trimester just because I was scared. Um, and then I had coffee the rest. Every day? A cup a day. The last two weeks, I've been having like seven <laughs> cups a day. Oh, <laughs> we, whatever it we takes. Went, it can take care of a headache too. That yeah. is for sure. That's actually a very good point. Is that Do you remember how jittery headaches. as opposed to <laughs> taking medicine. medicine? Yeah, I say rocket, have a cup of coffee for a for a headache. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned juice, right? Jamba juice, but it's not. I mean, not that there's anything wrong with Jamba juice. It's just some some of them are pasteurized and some of them are raw. So, what about juicing at home? Well, a lot of people are juicing now with all the food documentaries that talk about the benefits of raw. Right. Is that the same as going to a juicery? Well, I think that if it's a peeled fruit, it's safer. So grapefruit and oranges and lemons and limes and bananas as opposed to, and that's, I think, the truth with organic too just seems like if you make fresh juice and drink it right away at home that you're going to be okay i think so but that's probably a great time to say that we are not really giving medical advice so much as trying to get to the bottom <laughs> of the facts Disclaimer. Of but i also think these taboos. if you're making it at home you know you could triple wash things and you don't really know how well if you're going to a right. juice place how well it was washed or right. you know how long it was out I just feel like it's better to make your juice at home. Yeah, and just like Dr. Goldberg said, I think if you use organic, you're going to be better off. And if you scrub them, like you said, Anna, and uh, cut off parts of the fruit or vegetable that are bruised or damaged, then just drink it right away. I think you also made a good point. It's probably of the equipment. I think if you peel something and eat it fresh as opposed to putting it in a blender and the way it's processed, maybe the bacteria because it's been sitting and not cleaned properly. Right. 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 So, but at a juicery, they're doing that all day long. Right. But at so home, you assume you're going to clean it and then you juice it. You run it over right some on. boiling water. and yeah. Right. 
If you must have fresh juice, that's probably the way to do it. We are going to take a quick commercial break. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. <laughs> Let's move on to alcohol. For me, once I was in my third trimester, I didn't mind having some sips of wine, but it didn't even sound that great to me that I ever wanted more than that. So I wasn't trying to be anyone, you know, a big hero until the night that I had him, I didn't have as much as I had, but I wasn't afraid of it third trimester. So yeah, in Europe it's, there's, and you can speak to Russia, but there really isn't that, that taboo. In Europe, the, uh, is there a limit? Like, well, they're going to also do people be, drink, sit down and have a bottle be, of wine with I dinner? think for pregnant women, I did see a specialist when I was in Paris, but other than that, but we didn't talk about, I was uh, in my second trimester, but it, it wasn't about that. So he didn't talk to me about it, but I'm sure, uh, you know, for liability sake and just also for, for to, to be uh, and a vigilant against fetal alcohol syndrome, I'm sure they tell pregnant women not to overdo it and probably not to drink first and second trimester. I can't speak to that. For sure, but I, I can only imagine that that's how it is. But I think in general, the society has less of a taboo. And I think for sure, third trimester, those um, many, many of French women will. Right. Imbibe. We don't know what the limit is. So we don't know if it's one glass a day or a six pack a day or a right. bottle and a half. We don't know what that number is. And the number is probably different for different people. That's the thing. Right. It's very likely that some people tolerate it different than other people or process it different than other people. Sure. So because of that, we say no alcohol. Well, we don't say no alcohol. Well, I'm saying the government says there's government, no amount of alcohol yes, that's been that's proven true. safe for pregnancy. But. but I think, you know, down in the trenches, <laughs> yes. we say... Um, down on Wilshire. Yeah, <laughs> in Beverly Hills. We say, um, you know, I mean, if you're having a celebration, that you're having an anniversary or a birthday, if you have a glass of wine, it's fine. And they, I mean, people usually kind of hold me to how many can I have <laughs> in the pregnancy? <laughs> You know, and if I say you can, you know, try and limit yourself to a couple of glasses a month, three, four mm-hmm. glasses, not in the same sitting, right. um, <laughs> you know, that I think that that's very reasonable. I hear midwives all the time say about half a glass a week. So it's about the same that you're, you're It's saying. the same thing as the coffee sometimes. Like, I mean, seriously, some people just have the comfort of just like having right. a couple sips, mm-hmm. Yeah. you know, and if you have a couple sips with dinner twice a week. But you mentioned uh, Maria fetal alcohol syndrome, which is an irreversible condition that babies are born with that can lead to mental retardation and other problems. You know, I think uh, the flip side of that is when you hear that, you think, oh, my God, I'm never going to do anything that might ever put my baby at risk for that. But And the problem is we don't know how much. We don't know how much would cause that. Right. The people that babies are born with fetal alcohol syndrome are usually alcoholics. They drink a lot. I'm going to put all these different things on the website, informedpregnancy.com. And if you have questions, you can always write to info at informedpregnancy.com. Uh, moving forward, what about smoking is out. Do you, do you let any smoking? Do you? I discourage it. You discourage it. Some people are, they can't quit. Well, I mean, in my patient population, we do not have a lot of smokers. And people that are usually smokers usually come to me and say, I was a smoker, but I've just discovered I'm pregnant and I quit. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, I cannot remember the last time I had somebody who Mm. routinely smoked and was pregnant. People occasionally come and say, I feel so guilty, I was at a party and I I took a cigarette, (laughs) a a puff of a cigarette, which is not going to be harmful. Right. I I can remember too that just couldn't couldn't stop. They they scaled it back a lot, but they just couldn't quit. And I know there are some others who do, but won't admit it because they're so shamed, shamed by it. But um, smoking cigarettes is highly discouraged. And, and before you get pregnant, it's discouraged. Because ectopic pregnancies, as a pregnancy outside the uterus, the risk of an ectopic pregnancy is higher in mm-hmm. smokers. Mm-hmm. Ectopic so, pregnancy is where the baby implants someplace where it Someplace else. More com- most com- more, more commonly the fallopian tube, fallopian but it can be anywhere outside hmm. of the uterus. And you lose the and baby. You lose the baby. That's not good. It's, it's also dangerous for the mother. Correct. Absolutely. If you think you're going to get pregnant, good idea to quit smoking. How, how far advanced would you say? 20 to 30 years. Oh, perfect. <laughs> That's all? Yeah. <laughs> 
So if you're nine, <laughs> Way up. and you're in France, and listen right. to this podcast, then you're in luck. All right. What about marijuana? I hear conflicting things about marijuana because I see people use it for morning sickness, really bad morning sickness. I would have loved to, but I didn't. And why didn't you? Because I felt like I felt I felt that I would feel too guilty. I think just, I, mean, I don't, yeah. And because anything, if you look it up, any, anything you read, it says, don't do it. Right. I mean, I think this is a conversation that, um, you know, the current conversation, it will probably be different than a conversation that will take place in a couple of years from now because all the laws are changing. Right. Yeah, no, the it's legality legal in of several marijuana. states. Sure. Or, yeah. And so they're finding that there probably are medical, there are, I'm sorry, there are medical benefits to marijuana and and it's an ant has an anti nausea component to it. So um I don't think it's something that you will get me or probably most physicians to get to agree with. Right. But we may turn a blind eye to, you know, minimal use of it, you know, for, for benefits of anti nausea effects. I've had patients use it. I I don't know if they were recommended by a doctor to use it or not, but they've used it and with good success for the nausea. Right. But I'm not talking about like a little bit of, mm, I feel a little gross in the morning, or maybe I throw up in the morning. I'm talking about these people are sick all day long um, and just can't get any food down, which is also unhealthy. And then the alternatives start to become very powerful medications. And I guess what they do is they, they do this equation in their head and like, well, I could just have a little weed or I have to take these heavy medications. And I mean, that makes sense to me. Why is one better than the other? I do, I do think it also depends on where you are in your pregnancy. And unfortunately, a lot of the nausea is also first, first trimester. trimester. But right. I have had clients and I have met people that have nausea throughout their pregnancy. Okay, but again, if you're going to take those big heavy steroids in your first trimester, same thing, you're going to expose your baby See, to yeah, toxic just, elements either way. Yeah, if I, I had wouldn't. been that bad, if my, I'm, I also, I mean, I had morning sickness for four, till I was 14 weeks, but it wasn't so, so severe. If it was that severe, I was having right. to choose between marijuana and a steroid i would have chosen marijuana all natural organic yeah right and cut for oh. sure but i think the difference is is that one has been studied thoroughly right and one has not been done so as well and so right. if you have evidence that backs up the support of what you're calling heavy medications and no evidence to support Marijuana. Well, they are heavy medications. They're just, they are heavy medications. They're just heavily studied heavy medications. They're heavily studied. I mean, there's an algorithm that we go through that you know starts with simple things like taking a lemon and a lime and massaging it in your hand, and the aroma might help. Getting the C bands, the wristbands for mm -hmm. seasickness. Ginger products can be very helpful. Yeah. Vitamins like vitamin B6, and then you can introduce. IV um, hydration that sometimes help with. We have home health that's fantastic now. They come to your house. Mm -hmm. They put the IV in. They do sometimes administer medication with that. Right. But the medications now have been used for, for many years. Before you jump to the marijuana, I'm not like going Dr. To Berlin's me. recommending. No, the second um, <laughs> There I'm are alternatives <laughs> that might get you over the edge where you can start to eat a little bit. So, um, an acupuncture, I want to throw in there also, right. can be very helpful. Oh, for, I'm sorry, uh, I didn't mention that. No, Absolutely. Okay. That's what helps acupuncture, me. Acupuncture, for acupuncture sure. can be good. Okay, we're going to move on to positional things. Uh, my patients always ask me this question, do I have to sleep on my left side? Is that myth or fact? So, in pregnancy, we'll just give you a very quick anatomy lesson. You have a heart that pumps blood to the rest of your body, and so the major blood vessel that leaves the heart and takes it everywhere is called the aorta. And it kind of arcs up and then comes down and runs kind of over the mid portion, kind of runs over your spine. And then it splits into two down around your belly button. So before 24 weeks, I say sleep whatever way you want. Sleep on your stomach, sleep on your back. After 24 weeks, the uterus itself is then getting big enough and heavy enough that if you lie on your back for a prolonged period of time, it's going to press on that aorta and in theory diminish the blood flow below that area, which is the blood flow to the uterus. So you want to avoid lying on your back after about 24, 25 weeks. And I don't care what side you lie on. Okay, I don't care so, if it's your left or your right. Because Right. I think in the past, the thinking was what you're saying in terms of laying face down or on your back. 
but then also the vena cava that bring the blood flow back up to the heart from the legs is on the right side. So if the, the concern was if you sleep on the right side, then you're going to prevent that blood flow and eventually diminish flow to the baby. But So if you're waking up in the morning and your legs look like elephant trunks, yeah. <laughs> then don't lie don't on do that side anymore. <laughs> right. But I don't think that that's going to happen on a routine basis. I think that it's very uncomfortable to be pregnant especially later in the pregnancy <laughs> and very late i'm not going to restrict you to only lying on your left side because then i will be looked upon very poorly that is very good for the chiropractor and nobody else when people sleep on their left side the entire pregnancy right exactly i would also say that if you're going to decrease blood flow to the baby from the vena cava on the right side you're going to have a diminished blood flow first so you'll feel nauseous lightheaded dizzy something and you'll uh, get into a different position. What about the feet? People, you guys get foot massage. I know you do. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. We go to the, together, too. Together. We do, we go We've to all three been. Yeah, sure. with, without talking They didn't know I was there. <laughs> well, I had one at 8 p.m. the night that I had him. Oh, really? So maybe there is truth to what they say about foot massage. Well, I mean, acupuncture. I mean, there's pressure points, right? There is no truth to it, people, okay? Listen, I've been doing it for three weeks. That doesn't mean I anything. I scream, press harder. Right. Do it's all the, the points. Sake. It all goes back to that sake that you had. That and counteracts nothing. everything. <laughs> get foot massages and enjoy them. Maybe you should get one tonight. Get one tonight. You've tried everything. I got one last night. Oh, and I oh, thought I was in labor. And then that almost puts you into yeah. labor. Um, I think that there are pressure points that I know less about because I'm a Western trained medicine, Western medicine trained physician. But, uh, you know, there are Eastern philosophies and Eastern practices that there's truth to them. Mm-hmm. Acupuncture being one and acupressure being one. Yeah, those points, there are uterine points in the feet. There's no question. There's other uterine points in the body too. But um, my experience, and we do a lot of foot massage all throughout the pregnancy, is that if you want to, first of all, if it was a magic button, we'd have a line around the block, and Anna would be first in line, of uh, of people who want to get those babies out, like, push on my feet, push on my feet. It doesn't it doesn't work that way. But also, if even if you're trying to stimulate those points like we do in labor, um, you have to really push into them very deliberately and specifically and hold a lot of pressure there, which doesn't happen during uh, your foot massage that you have. You know, I don't know of a reason why you cannot get your nails done. And I don't think getting your nails done, a manicure or a pedicure, puts anybody into labor. <laughs> well, I don't know. Is the concern going to labor or is the it's concern more the, the, fumes. the fumes? I think people are worried about the formaldehyde and the toluene that are in the. Uh, nail polish yeah so I'm, uh, i think if you don't get them done i think it's actually a concern for people who work in the nail salon that's what i was right. going to say a right. hair salon a nail hair salon, salon, nail salon yeah. like what should i do i mean you probably should if you work there you probably should think about wearing a mask yeah i don't know if you yeah i don't know if i would work there if i was pregnant Gosh, I can't picture that. So, <laughs> you working there or right? all of the above? So I don't see it. Um, I think that um, safe recommendations would be try to go to a place that's really well ventilated. There are some places that have toxin-free nail polish, especially in Beverly Hills, mm-hmm. where you can go. Try not to get them done more than once a week. I want to paint my baby's room. Yeah, what about that? Low VOC. Low VOC paint. Low VOC ventilated. Zero. Yeah, super well ventilated. VOC. Stay out of there for a couple of days. Mm-hmm. Or have somebody else do it. Okay, what about exercise? People, you get both. You get people that were exercising a lot beforehand that want to keep exercising. People who never really exercise but want to be healthy for the baby. No, I exercise. Are you asking if I exercise? <laughs> no, I assume you exercise. <laughs> Benjamin, <laughs> this feel great. Isn't this about me? It's all about this is you. super helpful. Right. Are you pregnant? <clears throat> um, did you want to touch on exercise? So good. Um, I strongly encourage exercise, but exercise is very interesting because exercise gets you into shape and you want to be in shape when you're going to have to push, you have to push a baby out. It's pushing a baby out. You know, we equate it to running a marathon sometimes. I mean, some people have to push for a while and it's a laborious process. And so you really have to be in shape for it. But, um, the interesting thing is, is that when you exercise a lot during pregnancy is you're really increasing the blood flow to your entire body. And so in doing so, you increase the blood flow in theory to your baby, and it also makes you more hungry, so you eat a little bit more, and it may be healthy eating, 
but this may in turn translate into a bigger baby. Hmm. That's why I'm having such a big baby. And sometimes, <laughs> exercise? You didn't tell me that. people that exercise a lot <laughs> no. tend to have babies that are a little bit bigger, which is sure. kind of the opposite of what you might think. You would think they'd be more fit. Would happen, Amen. right? Yeah. But um, and so that's not such a bad thing. I mean, a big, healthy baby is good, and a mom in shape is a good thing. And being in shape actually also translates into you being able to rehabilitate yourself back into shape right. when you're done. So, I again, part of my speeches you can walk hike jog treadmill stairmaster if that still exists yeah. elliptical pilates yoga spinning swimming you can even do things like crossfit and <gasps> and boot camp and stuff like that but i usually say don't introduce one of those crazy ones if you haven't done it before right so if you've done it before if you spar with a trainer Spar with a trainer, but if you've never done that before, I don't think no, it's no, an great time exercise you should. I mean, I have horseback riders. Can I continue horseback riding? Yeah, what's the answer to that? If you've been a horseback rider and you're very comfortable on the horse, horseback ride. I ski every winter. I've skied every winter for my entire life. You know, I mean, I think doctors in Colorado, I read an article, they're like, yeah, we let our patients ski. It's They're better on skis than they're on their feet. They're going to mm. trip on their feet. They're going to be fine on skis. So, so the other skiers you got to worry about. Like, yeah, exactly. Like me, when I go for my third time down the slope. <laughs> yeah. Try not to die. What about hot yoga? Um, I usually say that, you know, because people that do yoga look at prenatal yoga and then they think it's a joke. Right. Um, not to insult prenatal yoga because there's a place for that for many people. But people that are really into yoga, you just have to maintain hydration. Right. You go into hot yoga and you start sweating yourself out. Right. And then you don't pee for two days. That's... Right. Not good. <laughs> right. So I would say um, hot yoga is fine. If you if you do hot yoga and you really love hot yoga, do it. Maybe do a 60-minute class instead of a 90-minute class right. or a 45-minute class instead of a 60-minute class and see how you feel when you do it. Yeah. But I do say keep your heart rate down. This is an opportunity for your husband to give you a gift of a heart rate monitor. And you get a mm. heart rate monitor, you keep your heart rate down below about 150 beats a minute. It's usually, I mean, some books will say 140, some will say 160, but it's in that one... 40 to 160 range, because when your heart accelerates, it's the blood flow is passing so fast, it's passing by the baby, so nutrients can't get dropped off and picked up. Got it. Uh, okay, <laughs> let's talk about sex. Uh, it's a huge question that comes up. Some women seem, and it changes throughout the pregnancy, right, more interested. Some seem less interested. Um, guys seem to be more worried about it, from what I can tell, than women. We are going to take a quick commercial break. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. <laughs> is there harm or is there risk of harming the baby from sex during pregnancy? No. I mean, there's a joke that goes along with that. Unless sure. You've got to tell it. Is. No. I Can't mean, just, just say that. Yes. I mean, there are some men that would like to believe they could. <laughs> 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 um, no. I mean, I think that the most important thing is intimacy is important throughout your pregnancy because as you're changing, you're physically feeling different and looking different. And so... Um, you know, it'd be nice if you guys could be intimate with each other. And it, it works both ways because, yes, your husband is going to probably be or your partner is going to be, um, you know, worried that they may be harming you or that they may have a reaction that creates a reaction in you that you didn't anticipate. And so I think intimacy throughout the pregnancy is important. And there's some thought that there's some prostaglandins in the sperm that at the end of the pregnancy that maybe it can trigger labor oh. and we no. have another <laughs> head shaking no that no the acupressure doesn't work the sex doesn't work the alcohol doesn't work we'll find something right. maybe, maybe just time works <laughs> yeah time does work she's going <laughs> we got an end date here she's moving <laughs> You can also tell she's a very happy person most of the time, and look at her now. <laughs> <laughs> so something's going on. Something's this happening. This is for real. Um, there are certain there are certain medical issues. Are there certain medical issues that would make sex a problem? Oh yes. So um, preterm labor, 
a shortening cervix called incompetent cervix. Oh. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, those kind of things. Yeah, so incompetent cervix is where your cervix, which holds the baby in, isn't doing the job, and so it shortens prematurely. If that's happening, I mean, your doctor will discuss this with you, but um, if you're starting to have premature contractions, again, the sperm may cause more contractions, so you want to avoid it, uh, sex for that, those reasons. If you're having bleeding early in the pregnancy, bleeding can be triggered from intercourse. So if you uh, usually my rule is if you have sex and you have bleeding, then no sex or exercise for, I say, two to three days. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And let things cool down. If you have sex again and you have bleeding again shortly thereafter, then you might want to wait a longer period of time. Yeah, sure. But check in with the doc just to make sure that they are aware of everything that's going on. Also, if your water's broken. No sex? No sex. Well, I mean, you can hear different opinions, but it's you generally do not want anything inserted or um, in the vagina if your water is already broken. What if you're having sex and your water breaks? I think... God's got that covered. <laughs> <laughs> Can he finish? Is that what the question is? <laughs> right. <laughs> that's not, that's yeah. so excited yeah. that everything you just finished. Just, just <laughs> you know. How do you even know? And what about, what about post, baby? What about postpartum? How long should you wait oh. to have sex? So typically the recommendation is to wait six weeks. So you usually see your doctor six weeks after a vaginal delivery. So mm-hmm. we usually say wait the six weeks. Um, if you've had a C-section, the question often is... Why do I have to wait six weeks? Right? (laughs) Right. So if you feel like having sex four weeks after you've had a baby and you had a C-section, more power to you. But I don't know if if that's going to be a a strong desire. Our patients are sometimes... Occasionally I have a patient that comes back and says, we already had sex. More often I have, can you give me another two weeks? Is there a concern of oral sex during pregnancy, medically speaking? Yes. Um air in the vagina and i mean the 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 likelihood of this happening is very small right would that be more from intercourse than from oral sex no well i guess theoretically but i mean if air is gets into the bloodstream then that can cause what's called an air embolism oh good night Good night. Yeah, <laughs> literally. Good Glad night. Okay. Right. <laughs> Me too. So um, that's why we discourage things like water skiing or water sports, where you could like hit the water hard and right. water can taking a lot of air. Taking a lot of air. So, um, so am I discouraging one from oral intercourse during pregnancy? No, but I guess you would have to warn your partner. What about this question comes up a lot? Can I? Pet my cat. People are always worried about their cats. What is the concern with cats? Do you guys have cats? Do you have a cat? Anna does. I have two. You have two cats? Do you pet the cat? Yes, and they even sleep with me. So what is the concern? Why cats and not other animals? Uh, toxoplasma. Okay. Is it is bacteria? It's in cat feces and um, uncooked meat. Why it chose those two places to live, I'm not exactly <laughs> sure. Seriously. But uh, so we say we discourage meat. you from changing the litter box of cats. Nowadays, we're very lucky because most of these things are automated. They have automated cat box cleaners. But um, sitting on your lap, petting your cat, all that kind of stuff. I mean, what if my cat doesn't forgets to use the litter box and has a little poop? Can I pick it up? You know, you hopefully have somebody else that can help you pick it up. But if you needed to pick it up. Um, you know, if you wore a glove or if you washed your hands immediately after with soap and avoid any contact with your mouth or nose, that's beneficial. So you can play with the cat. You just can't change the litter. It's Correct. in the poop. It's in the poop. So they get it the same way we would get it. They eat like raw rodents and snakes and birds and things like that. It gets into their digestive system and they poop it out. So if you're just playing with your cat, you should be okay. But if you're changing the feces, you might become infected. Right. And, you know, a lot of people come in and they say, I had a, I've had cats for my whole life. Can I get tested for toxoplasma? And then you, if you carry immunity to it, then there's maybe a little bit more safety. Oh, I was uh, positive for it way before I got pregnant. Yeah. So you probably carry an immunity to it. So you, you probably should be less concerned. Oh, yeah. I want to say about toxoplasma that it's, um, it doesn't become, it's a parasite. It doesn't become infectious until one to five days after it sheds from the cat feces. So if you change the litter every day, you're going to avoid getting infected from it. And of course, if you're the one that has to do it, you wear gloves and you wash your hands really thoroughly before and after. Uh, We talked about nail polish, hair dye, 
Is do people ask you about that? Sure. Um, so I usually say avoid hair coloring in the first trimester, and this is not something I learned in medical school. It's something I learned while practicing in Beverly Hills. Um, <laughs> so usually avoid touching the roots in the first trimester. <laughs> You can highlight your hair, but again, avoid touching the roots. If you if you really have to color your hair, try and have the vegetable dyes, which are not chemical free. They're just Less reduced chemical. in the amount of chemicals they have. And so, um, again, you know what? It's kind of sexy to have different color roots. Moving right along, <laughs> tanning, tanning beds, tanning sprays. So. Um, I mean, this comes up a lot of times. People want to get a little something before they go on vacation because they don't want to go on vacation and get burnt. The baby moon. They go on the baby moon or whatever it might be. Um, I mean, I'm not a big fan of them in the general sense. Uh, I mean, I, I will say if you want to go into the tanning bed once or twice before a vacation, that's fine. But don't make a habit of it. Mm-hmm. I think the I think like you said, it's more of a risk to the mother than the baby. Sure. And um, seemingly linked to an increased risk of melanoma, which is the most dangerous type of skin cancer, from the tanning beds, the UV tanning beds. What about air travel? First trimester, last trimester, everything in between. I say no travel after about 34 weeks. And if you have twins or a multiple gestation pregnancy, I just say 30 weeks. Um, is it a, a risk or is it just a practically what if you go into labor? Is there an issue with the altitude, with the UV? Well, flights are pressurized cabins, so there is, you know, barometric pressure changes um, that can adjust the equilibrium within the uterus, mm-hmm. so the uh, bag of membranes can rupture. But uh, I mean, you know, people often the the biggest question I get typically is, "I'm going to Colorado. Denver's a mile high. Mm-hmm. Is that going to be a concern because it's a pressurized Your cabin?" And then I land in in a higher place. Yes, these things are definitely risks. I mean, again, I've been practicing for what I feel is a long time. And I've had one person break her bag of water. She was about 36 weeks when she got off a flight. I mean, was that because of the flight tonight? Yeah. (laughs) Was that the flight that did it? I mean, I don't think it was the flight that did it. So I think that it's more of a concern of I might deliver where I am. Right. You know? And so. Where do you put the seatbelt? Underneath, just like that. you do in the car, under under the belly. Oh, right. Oh, this yeah. Usually it goes across the belly. Yeah, yeah, under. It's deep under the belly. Any other tips for flying? Do you guys, did you fly? You flew a lot, pregnant. Mm-hmm, but I've been, I haven't flown, I, don't, I think I was six months pregnant by the time I came back from work, so I haven't flown since then. Was it different flying six months pregnant? I, flying pregnant is the worst thing on the planet. You have to get up every hour and walk around. You have to pee. You're uncomfortable. You get up and walk around because you're uncomfortable or to just get your circulation going? For your circulation every hour. Or, I mean, that's what I would do. But so you have to set a phone, uh, your alarm on your phone. Your phone's going off. It's terrible. You can also get dehydrated up there. So it's, <laughs> Oh, yeah, then uh, you're worried about that, too. So then you're drinking all this water. Drink a lot of water, water you're, so you're actually more. eating up every 30 minutes. <laughs> do you guys have any other questions besides these questions? Oh, I do. What about if you if the, a pregnant woman is choking and you have to perform CPR? Oh, the Heimlich. Yeah, where do you put your hands? Underneath. Underneath the belly or underneath your... Ask a doctor. You are a doctor. <laughs> um, I hope you are never in, in that, that situation. situation. Me too, but we were just talking about it last night at home, and I didn't know if you would put it above or below your belly. I think you'd try both. I think you'd try. I would try Until above first. Either work, yeah. Or if Not you're pregnant, just high. don't choke. Right? I mean, it would be, I'd try above. I mean, I'm just I guessing I used to be here. a medic working in ambulances, now I'm trying to. But I, I, I would try above, because, right, the baby's down here, but right. not so high that you're in the xiphoid process. Right? Which Unless is that little The tip right of there. the breastbone that sticks oh, down. Right. I would come underneath there and try to create the pressure from there. I think you can do it. I've done this actually many times on people, not pregnant, but I think that you can do it from there. You've but done the Heimlich several times. On. Yeah. Because really? you're a paramedic. Yeah. Oh, that makes sense. <laughs> so, right. but um, I think if you come from underneath, you're much more likely to injure the baby and get less, less of an, effect, of an effective pressure, right? release right. of that food. Um, do you guys take baths? 
Hot baths? Oh, every day. She does a lot. Hot, warm? Like a hundred. A hundred degrees? Yeah. What would you do if you weren't pregnant? Like a hundred and two. Okay, so not <laughs> much different. Yeah, I would always, you know, get it get in like a hundred and one as it's kind of going back to one hundred. I, I like very, very hot baths, so it would be... Uh, but I was paranoid the first six months, so I had like it was like always like, and we both ninety nine like ninety eight yeah. point. We both eight. have those. Um, they make those little bath thermometers now. That's like a ducky or oh, whatever, and he like changes color for the babies. in the bad area. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's yeah, oh, that's it's nice. Great to keep for your little one then too. So, it's... What's my your recommendation usually is. A bath is uh, not circulated hot water. So get into the bath as hot as you want. It could be 102, but don't add more hot water. So once it starts to cool down, you're done. But a spa, jacuzzi, sauna, they're all sort of recirculating that heat oh. constantly. So you get into 102 and you're in 102 for 10 minutes, right? 20 minutes. You get into a bath and it's 102 and a minute later it's 101 and a minute after that it's 100. I mean, it goes down and down and down pretty quickly. So you can get into a hot tub and nice and relax your muscles, but... Once it cools down, you don't want to add more hot water. Can I get in a jacuzzi? I mean, yes, you can sit on the top step and your butt and your legs can be in there, but you don't want to submerse the baby for more than a... Right. And I think even in a bath, you're more likely to have part of you outside of the water than if you're in a jacuzzi where mm-hmm. you're just totally... Well, have you seen their bathtubs? <laughs> well, no, I haven't. <laughs> Mine is actually really little. Hmm. Is part of you out of the water when you're in the bath? Yeah, like my belly's out and my top. Like oh, see, so that's shoulder. a lot less uh, of a risk. Uh, what's is there a magic number? The core, we're worried about the core temperature getting too hot. Yeah, so that is something you're concerned about. Like you want to avoid that. So when you're sick in the middle of winter or whenever you get a, a cold, <clears throat> that's the one thing. Like a stuffy nose and a sore throat and a headache. Those are bad for you, but they're not bad for the baby. A fever is bad for a baby, for and so we usually want you to. That's the one time that we would encourage you to take medicine is to take something to bring a fever down. That medicine is typically Tylenol. I've heard of it. And that medicine now has been, there's a new study that just came out about tyl- overuse of Tylenol and ADHD. it being a problem. <clears throat> so um, if you're going to use Tylenol, use it. It's safe in pregnancy in moderation. Sparingly. Sweet. I think we covered a lot of information yeah. today. Like I said before, we're going to put all these facts and figures up on the website so that uh, our listeners can get the information that they need to make informed choices, which is um, our goal. I want to thank everybody for being here, Dr. Jake Goldberg and Maria and Anna, who's hopefully like, what do you think tonight? I hope. Um, Thank you so much for being here and sharing your expertise and helping people make more informed choices. That is the Informed Pregnancy Podcast. You can visit us at informedpregnancy.com. And if you have any questions, feel free to write to info at informedpregnancy.com. 